أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى this evening we're going to continue in our series of lessons in the uh, book كتاب فضائل القرآن for the book, The Virtues of the Qur'an, from the Sahih of Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. <coughs> uh, this evening we have reached to chapter number three, where Al-Imam um, al-Bukhari, uh, rahimahullah, he says, Bab Jam'u al-Qur'an. The chapter of the gathering or the collection of the Quran. Now, here in this chapter, Al Imam Al Bukhari, Rahimullah, is going to discuss and explain how did the Quran uh, come to us to be in the Mus'haf that we see it in today. Because during the time of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Qur'an was written. Let's get that understood. The Prophet ﷺ used to order certain individuals to write the Qur'an down. He used to order certain individuals to write the Qur'an down and they were known as Qutab al-Wahi, the writers of revelation. And we're going to talk about them uh, in a different class, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, however, uh, so during the time of the Prophet <coughs> Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He used to order individuals To uh, To write down The Quran Then the general public The general masses of the Muslims Were also given permission To write down The Quran As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Used to order the people not to write anything other than uh, the Qur'an. And then that was later uh, abrogated and people were allowed to write down the speech of the Prophet Wasallam. The point here is that during the time of the Messenger Wasallam, the Qur'an was written. The Qur'an was written by the command of the Messenger Wasallam. When verses were revealed, the Prophet ﷺ would call for the writers of Revelation and he would order them to write down uh, the verse that or the verses that were revealed to him. <coughs> However, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the Quran was not compiled into book form as we see it today. <coughs> the Quran was not compiled into book form. Uh, as we see it today. Uh, so Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's going to discuss how did, uh, how did we go from the Qur'an being written down on uh, different items uh, like the le leather or the inscription in soft rock or the date palms uh, or these types of things. How do we go from that to actually having the Quran in, compiled into book form that we have today? So Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he brings under uh, this chapter, he brings three narrations. Uh, and the first narration is going to discuss the compilation of the Quran uh, in its first stage. And the second uh, narration is going to discuss uh, the compilation of the Qur'an in its second stage. And inshallah ta'ala, once we go through the two hadith, inshallah we'll see, we'll go through this and we'll explain um, basically based on the narration, what was the first stage, why did, uh, who, who was responsible, who was responsible for it, why was the decision made uh, in the first stage, and we're going to discuss that. Uh, also in the second narration to discuss the second stage as well. So Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he says under the first hadith uh, underneath of this chapter, 
He says that we were told by Musa ibn Ismail, who reports on the authority of Ibrahim ibn Sa'd, who, who says we, we were told by Ibn Shihab. Uh, do you, huh? Yes, Az Zuhri. Muhammad ibn Muslim ibn Shihab, uh, Az Zuhri. Um, <clears throat> we said that he was from, his, his lineage connects with the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where? Kilab. Very good. Because he, his grandfather was, who was his grandfather? Zahra ibn Kilab. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's grandfather was? Huh. Uh, Ikhwan. No, well, it means not his grand, not his 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 great 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 grandfather. That's what I meant by that. Because I don't remember exactly. Uh, so I didn't want to mess up and say be exact. So I just, he's his grandfather. Seventh. It's his seventh grandfather. That's what you're saying. He memorized it, but forgot. Khair, inshallah. What we're gonna do, inshallah, we're gonna put the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on a piece of paper, and we're gonna hand that out. So that everybody can memorize the lineage of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that we know, we know there's ittifaq, there's a collective agreement from uh, Abdullah, his father, all the way to Adnan. There's a collective agreement. And then there's some disagreements uh, between Adnan and Ismail while they all agree that Adnan is from the, uh, the children of or from the uh, lineage of, <coughs> of Ismail. But it's important uh, because uh, to know the lineage of the Prophet Wasallam, our shayukh used to, um, in the lecture, just in the middle of the lecture, run off the lineage of the Prophet Wasallam from his father all the way to Adnan. Just in the middle of a lecture, and you will just, you know, some of our shayukh would just you know, say he's Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn 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 all the way to Adnan. And I've seen this done on multiple occasions. Um, and they used to express to us the importance of uh, learning the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because it's a part of knowing an individual, a part of knowing an individual is knowing uh, that individual's lineage. And uh, the more... Uh, the, the, in order for us to love someone, then the first thing we have to do is we have to know them. And when we meet somebody <coughs> in the masjid or at a function, one of the first things we say is, what's your name? Right? Then what's the next question uh, that comes right after that? Where are you from? Right? What's your name? Where are you from? Right? Because this is how you uh, introduce yourself to someone. And this is how you get to know someone. And if we do not know the name of the Prophet وسلم, if we don't know where he's from, then it's going to be very difficult for us to claim that we know him. And then if, we, if it's difficult to claim that we know him, then it's going to be difficult to claim that we love him. And then to say that we love him more than we love our own selves and we love our own families, that's going to be uh, even more difficult. So I advise myself and I advise us all uh, to get to know the Prophet وسلم, first and foremost, it's just by learning his name uh, and his lineage. Sallallahu alayhi wa Anyway, here, Ibrahim, Ibrahim ibn Sa'ad, he says, we were told by Ibn Shihab, who reports on the authority of Ubaid ibn Sabbaq, who says that Zayd ibn Thabit, radiallahu anhu, said. <coughs> so now this is Zayd uh, ibn Thabit, radiallahu anhu, uh, telling us the story of what happened. And he's, he's an authority on the subject because he was directly involved in both stages. Zayd ibn Thabit was directly involved in both stages uh, as we're going to see inshallah. So Zayd ibn Thabit, radiallahu anhu, he said, uh, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, uh, he sent me after the, uh, the killings that took place in Yamama. <coughs> um, do you know what Yamama, where Yamama is? Anas, do you know where Yamama is? Okay. Uh, 
Rashid, you know where your mama is? Okay. Uh, your mama is, is, is modern day Saudi Arabia. It's in the Arabian Peninsula. I don't, maybe it might not, I don't know if it extend, if it's, if it, if it goes out to Kuwait, in that area, Allah knows best, but it's in uh, the Arabian Peninsula. It's going in, in this, the, in the area close towards Nejd. In the area where Nejd is at, in that area, that's where you'll find Yamama. That's where you find Yamama. This is the place of uh, Musaylama al kadhab So Musaylama al kadhab I think we talked about him uh, before. <coughs> he uh, claimed prophecy. He claimed that, Ibn Salam rahmatullah, he claimed that their, uh, that revelation was descending upon him. And he called himself uh, Rahman al Yamama. He called himself the Rahman of Yamama. And, and for this reason, he's known now today as Musaylama al Kathab. Musaylama the liar. Right? We don't just call him Musaylama. No one calls him Musaylama. No one says that. We, when we refer to him, we call him Musaylama al Kathab. Musaylama the liar. Because he claimed to be Rahman al Yamama. <coughs> he claimed to be Rahman of Yamama. And we know that Rahman is one of the names that is specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is not permissible for a person to name himself uh, Rahman. Al Muhim, so Yamama, um, after the death of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, Yamama became a stronghold for Kufr <coughs> because um, there were some of the Arabs who left Islam after the death of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what they did was they turned to uh, Musaylama al kadhab they turned towards him and his uh, newly founded uh, religion that he was trying to, uh, trying to establish. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu fought him. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu fought him. Uh, <coughs> So, but in the, in, in the fighting, in that fighting, there were many of the Qurra, or many of those who memorized the Qur'an, they had died in that battle. They had died in that battle. So now Zayd, Rabbi Ta'ala, he's saying that after the incident, or after the, the, the fighting that took place in al Yamama, uh, Abu Bakr called for me. Abu Bakr Call for me. So he says, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab عندهم. So when I came, I found Umar ibn al-Khattab was with him. <coughs> so now Zayd gets called by Abu Bakr, who was at that time the Khalifa. He's at that time the Khalifa. And he said, I, I responded. And when I arrived, Umar was with him. Umar was with him. So Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala said, so now Abu Bakr is now talking to Zayd. He says, Abu Bakr said to Zayd, Umar came to me and he said, In al qatla qad istaharra yom al yamama bil qurra, or bil qurra al Quran, which translates to, to mean roughly that the killing that took place uh, at Yamama had taken away many of our reciters of the Qur'an. <clears throat> Meaning those people who memorized the Qur'an and they knew the Qur'an frontwards, backwards, up, down, they knew the Qur'an. Uh, they participated in the battlefield and many of them were killed. Many of them were killed uh, in Yemen. And so uh, Omar says, and he's speaking to Abu Bakr, uh, I fear that if this killing continues of our uh, reciters of the Qur'an, then we're going to lose much of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed uh, in the Qur'an. Uh, and so he says, so I see, so Umar is speaking to who? Abu Bakr. He says, وَإِنِّي أَرَى أَن تَأْمُرَ بِجَمْعِ Quran." And so he said, it's my opinion, I see that you should command someone 
to collect the Qur'an, meaning gather it all into one place, like collect it all into one collection, into one book. <coughs> so now, let's stop here for a second. Why did Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, suggest this to Abu Bakr? Why was this suggestion brought up? Because he was fearful that they would lose the, the recitation of the Quran. They were fearful that they were, he was fearful that the, with the loss of the memorizers, because in the, in the battle of Yamama, in the battle of, uh, in Yam, of Yamama, many of the Quran, it wasn't just one or two, three or four, 10 or 20. You're talking about a long list of individuals who were killed, uh, some, some, of the, some of the foremost of the reciters of the Quran from the Sahaba, some of the foremost of those who recited the Quran uh, from the Sahaba were killed in the Battle of Yemen. But just let, let's, let's hold off the questions, inshallah, because we have to get through. We got two long hadith that we need to get through, inshallah. So just remember that, and then we'll get back to that, inshallah. Uh, and so many of the Qur'a <coughs> were killed in this, at this time. So Umar suggested to Abu Bakr, Umar suggested uh, to Abu Bakr that you command that the Qur'an be collected and gathered. Now this shows uh, that the idea that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, now if uh, Umar had a position amongst the Sahaba, he had position, and his, if Umar, when Umar spoke, people listened. When Umar spoke, people listened. But Umar did not circumvent the authority of Abu Bakr. Umar did not circumvent the authority of Abu Bakr by going around and, you know, presenting his idea to people and saying, hey, uh, what do you, you know, this is a good idea. Why don't you support me, support me, support me. And then once he's gained all, of his, all this support, then he goes to Abu Bakr to have a discussion. La. What he did was he went directly to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala, who was the Khalifa, and presented his idea and presented his case. He presented his idea and he presented his case. And Abu Bakr disagreed with him at first, as we're going to see, inshallah. But once he presented his case, and he was, he was persistent, Abu Bakr saw things the way that Omar saw things. <coughs> so, he uh, goes on. So Abu Bakr says, so I said to Umar. Abu Bakr, he says, I said to Umar, كَيْفَ نَفْعَلُ شَيْئًا لم يفعله رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, "How can we do something that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم didn't do?" So Umar, رضي الله تعالى عنه, he said, "هذا والله خير." That was his response. هذا والله خير. He said, "This, I swear by Allah, is good." He said, "This, I swear by Allah, is good." And so, so now, one, it's something that we need to, uh, this statement that, that the Prophet Wasallam didn't do this, one of the things we need to stop and, 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 and mention is that, as we've said just a few moments ago, uh, this is not referring to writing the Qur'an down because the Qur'an was written down on pages and on different items during the time of the Prophet Wasallam. And by the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And <coughs> so the issue here was only collecting those writings, those verses, and putting them into one place. That was the issue. And so we also have to understand this in light of the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said, اِقْتَدُوا بِالَّذَيْنِ مِنْ بَعْدِي Abu Bakr wa Umar. Follow those two who are going to come after me, Abu Bakr and Umar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, عَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي 
وسنة الخلفاء الراشدين المهديين من بعد عضوا عليها بالنواجد Allah, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I command you to stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided uh, khulafa who will come after me. Grab and hold on to that with your molars. And this, this effort, this effort of compiling the Qur'an into one book was agreed upon by all four of the khulafa. It was agreed upon by all four of the khulafa. And it's not mentioned uh, in these narrations. Um, when this, these narrations that we're going to mention, uh, as mentioned by Bukhari, explicitly mentions the approval of Abu Bakr, the approval of Umar, the approval of Uthman, and there are other narrations that are not mentioned here in the Sahih of Bukhari of Ali defending the actions of Abu Bakr uh, and, and Uthman. Ali radiallahu defended the actions of Abu Bakr and Uthman. And so this shows us that all four of the Khulafa were in collective agreement on this action. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Alaykum bi Sunnati wa Sunnati al Khulafa al Rashidina min Ba'di. I command you to follow my Sunnah and the Sunnah of the rightly guided Khulafa who will come after me. <coughs> and so. Um, so Abu Bakr says, how can we do something that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't do? And Umar said, Hada wallahi khair. He said, this I swear by Allah. It was a heavy statement. Now, Abu Bakr just said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't do it. And then Umar turns around and swears by Allah that this is something that is good, it's something that is necessary. So, he said, so Abu Bakr says that he didn't cease... Uh, Discussing the issue with me, حَتَّى شَرَحَ اللَّهُ صَدْرِي لِذَلِكَ وَرَعَيْتُ فِي ذَلِكَ الَّذِي رَأَى عُمَرَ He said he didn't stop discussing the issue with me until Allah opened my chest and I saw things the way that Umar saw them. <coughs> and I saw things the way that Umar uh, saw them. So Abu Bakr says to Zayd, You are a young man. Who has intellect? We don't uh, la tahimuka, meaning we don't uh, accuse you in your religion. There's nothing that we have against you in your religion. You're not someone who is a fasiq. You're not someone who commits sins, and and, and you're not someone who steals from the people. Uh, <coughs> you're honest, and so we don't accuse you of anything. Uh, and you used to write the revelation for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you're young, which means you have energy. You're intelligent, you have intellect, means you're, you're smart. You have good religion. And you were entrusted by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to write the revelation. <coughs> and so all these characteristics were included in Zayd ibn Thabit. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So he says, so collect, uh, so search for the Quran and gather it and collect it. Now, uh, we're going to stop again for just a moment. What did it mean when Abu Bakr told him to search for the Quran and collect it? Did Abu Bakr not? Memorize the Quran? Did Umar not memorize the Quran? Did Zayd not memorize the whole Quran? Yes. All three of them memorized the Quran. But what it meant was <coughs> to search for the Quran and to gather it and collect it. What that meant was there were going to be uh, there was going to be a process. There was going to be a process as to how they're going to go about establishing the Mus'haf. Now, I memorize the Qur'an, you memorize the Qur'an, he memorized the Qur'an. We're not going to write and establish the Mus'haf like this. Not going to do that. We're going to have a process. And so, part of the process was that Zayd, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, had to find the verse written with someone. Oh, mashallah. 
Zayd radiallahu had to find the verse written. Right? So meaning, <coughs> meaning that I'm going to go around, knock on Bilal's door. Knock, 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 knock. Um, which verses of the Quran do you have written down from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And then you bring out what you, what you, uh, you show me what you have written from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what you heard being recited from the Messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam. Okay. And I go to Jasim's house. Knock, 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 knock. Open the door. What do you have of the Quran? And, I, and now I'm looking and I'm reviewing. Okay. Now, once that wasn't it. That was part of the process. Once they found, once they found the, the, the verse, a verse written. Once Zayd found a verse written. The second step of the process was he had to have two witnesses that testified that they heard the Prophet وسلم, reciting this verse like as such. Now, mind you, as I said, Zayd memorized the Quran. So, <clears throat> Zayd, so Abu Bakr didn't tell him, just come in here and sit down and write the Quran from memory. So when he told him, uh, search and collect the Quran, this is what he was referring to. They developed the process uh, first, the, the verse had to be written, the verse had to be written, and then you had to have two individuals testify that they heard the Prophet وسلم, recite this verse as, as, as they had found it written. Once they had that, then it was affirmed uh, that this is going into the, to the Mus'haf. Right? <clears throat> so, Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, he says, فَوَاللَّهِ لَوْ كَلَّفُونِي نَقْلَ جَبَلٍ مِنَ الْجِبَالِ مَا كَانَ أَثْقَلَ عَلَيَّ مِمَّا أَمَرَنِي بِهِ مِنْ جَمْلِ الْقُرْآنِ He said, I swear by Allah, if they would have asked me to move a mountain, that would have been easier than what they asked me to do as it relates to gathering the Qur'an. And so this was a huge responsibility. A huge Responsibility. Um, and and Zayd radiallahu ta'ala who understood <coughs> um, the importance of this. So Zayd said, after Abu Bakr presented his case of what he wanted him to do, Zayd said, Kaifa tafa'aluna shay'an lam yaf'alhu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The same response that Abu Bakr gave was the response that Zayd gave. How can you do something that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, didn't do. And so Abu Bakr said, Huwa Wallahi Khair. He said, This is what well, I swear by Allah, this is good. And Zayd said, He did not cease uh, discussing the issue with me until Allah opened my chest to see things the way that Abu Bakr and Umar uh, saw things. <coughs> he said, So I began my search. Uh, and I collected uh, the Qur'an from the date palm leaves, from um, the, the clay, because the, the soft, uh, there's a type of, 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 not rock, but it's like a type of clay that's a, it's soft enough for you to, like you took like a stick, you can actually write uh, in it. Uh, the pages, he said, was sudur al-rijal, and the memory of the men. He said, until... I found the last of Surah At-Tawbah with an individual named Abi Khuzayma Al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I did not find it with anyone other than him. Uh, and it was the statement of Allah, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ Until the end of the surah. And so he said that he found, me, when he said what he means by this, as I said, he, did, he doesn't mean that He's the only Sahabi that knew this, this ayah or these ayat. La. Zayd himself was a memorizer of the Quran, and Abu Bakr was a memorizer of the Quran, and Umar was a memorizer of the Quran. What he meant was he didn't find this ayat written. He didn't find this ayat written or these ayat written except with Abi Khuzayma. Now he knew that these ayats existed, 
which is why he was searching for it to begin with. He was searching for it to begin with because he knew that this verse was a part of Surah Tawbah. He knew that these verses were part of Surah Tawbah. But again, the process that, uh, that they made for collecting and, and compiling the Qur'an is that it had, they had to find it written. They had to find it written. And so he said that uh, the only person that he found that had this ayah actually written was uh, an individual, his name was Abu Khuzayma al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Um, <clears throat> so he goes on, he says, so the, uh, the suhuf, meaning these pages that had the Quran written in them, was with Abu Bakr until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called him back and then it was with Umar uh, until the end of his life and then it was with Hafsa, the daughter of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So now, this is the first stage. This is the first stage of the compilation of the Qur'an. Is that one Mus'haf was gathered, was created. And where, where did that Mus'haf go? Who had it? Abu Bakr. And then when he died? Umar. And then when Umar died? It went with his, his daughter Hafsa. What happened to that Mus'haf when Hafsa died? Uh. No, because she lived long. She lived well into the, the Dola of Umawiyah. She lived into the Dola of Umawiyah. So Uthman had, uh, had came to, into, into the, become the Khalifa, and then he was assassinated, and then Ali, Ali was assassinated, uh, and then Muawiyah, and then Muawiyah died, um, and then uh, Yazid, and... Uh, she died, uh, she died, Hafsa, radiallahu ta'ala anha, she died during the Imara of Marwan ibn Hakam uh, of Medina. Now Marwan ibn Hakam eventually ended up becoming the Khalifa. I think he was the fourth Khalifa of the, uh, of the, of the Umawis. Um, but um, she died, Hafsa died during the time of the Imara, meaning that Marwan ibn Hakam was the Amir of Medina. He was the Amir of Medina. And I want to say that Yazid was the Khalifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I don't remember if it was Muawiyah. Uh, if, if Marwan was put in charge by Muawiyah or he was put in charge of Medina by Yazid, Allah knows best. But he was in charge of Medina. He was in charge of Medina. And he used to tell Hafsa, come here, bring me that copy. Bring me the copy. And she used to say no. I'm not giving it to you. He would go back, give me the, give it to me. She said no. She refused. Until when, <coughs> when she died, uh, that, that copy, that Mus'haf went to uh, Abdullah ibn Umar. And uh, when, which was, what was the relation between Abdullah and Hafsa? Their brother and sister. Their brother and sister. So Abdullah took it and Marwan sent for that copy and Abdullah turned it over to Marwan and Marwan uh, had it burnt. Marwan had it burnt. So this is what happened to, uh, this is, well, there's, well, there's a reason, um, there's a reason for this. And Allah knows best um, uh, what the ulama had to say as it relates to whether it was good or bad, but there was a reason. <clears throat> and I believe that Hafsa understood this is why uh, Marwan wanted the, the, the copy and this is, one, this is why she told him no. This is why she told him no. <clears throat> Actually, what happened was Uthman, which we're going to see inshallah in just a moment. When Uthman began his effort, because remember the, the, the copy was with Hafsa. And so Uthman actually went to her to request the copy and she said no. And, and until... Until he gave her an ahd that he was going to give it back to her once he was finished. And when he gave her the covenant that he was going to give it back to her once he was finished, then she said, okay. <clears throat> so uh, this is the first stage of compiling uh, the Quran into the Mus'haf. This is the first stage. And it was because Umar, 
he saw that all these individuals had been killed and he feared that the Quran uh, was going to be lost. And so he came, he said, listen, let's do the, make this effort. Abu Bakr disagreed at first. And then after discussion, he saw things the way that Omar saw them. And so they put in charge of the effort, Abu Bakr put in charge of the effort, Zayd ibn Thabit. He put in charge of the effort, Zayd ibn Thabit. And uh, <clears throat> then the action was completed. And that Mus'haf was with Abu Bakr. And then it stayed with Umar, and then it went to Hafsa. Uh, <coughs> the next, the second hadith, uh, Imam Al Bukhari, rahimahullah, he says, "We were told by Musa, bin, uh, we were told by Musa, which is Musa bin Ismail, who said that we were told by Ibrahim, um, which is Ibrahim ibn Sa'd, who reports, who said, or he says that we were told by Ibn Shihab." who reports that Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu told him. Now, if you look at this isnad, you see it is the same isnad as the previous hadith. The first isnad goes from Ibn Shihab to Ubaid ibn Sabaq, when he thought of Zaid. This isnad, it, stopped, it goes from Ibn Shihab to Anas ibn Malik. Now, even though it's the same isnad, Al-Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he showed that these are two separate hadith. Ibn Shihab, he narrated this hadith. He also narrated this hadith. So he narrated both of these stories. He narrated both of these stories. The first story, the, 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 the compilation of the Quran with Abu Bakr, he narrated from Ubaid ibn Sabbat, on the authority of Zayd ibn Thabit. And the second narration, which is the second stage, which is the story of Uthman, Ibn Shihab narrates this directly from Anas ibn Malik anhu. And in Bukhari, he did not put them together because they are two separate hadith, even though they have the same chain of narration going back to Ibn Shihab. Does that make sense? We had it? Okay, inshallah. Maybe if, 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 some, if I've confused somebody, inshallah, after, the, after Salah, we can go to the board and I can write it down, inshallah, we can show and explain. The point here is that Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he separated these two hadith or these two narrations into two separate hadith. And someone may ask, why did he do that when it's the same chain of narration? We say that he did that because they're two separate hadith. Is the Muslim the same? No, it's two different stories. And so someone may think, well, Bukhari separated one story. We say that. Ibn Shihab narrated this hadith at one time, and then he narrated a separate hadith at a different time, but it just so happened to be to the same student. Right? Just like how we're sitting here right now. If I tell you more than one hadith, right? I tell you the first hadith, and then I tell you another hadith. So then you go and you tell the first hadith, and then you tell the second hadith. But you, there were two separate hadith. From one individual, from the same sheikh to the same student, right? And so someone may come and say, this is the same hadith because it has the same chain. We say, no, even though it has the same chain, it's two separate hadith. Uh, and even Shihab, rahimahullah, did not narrate the hadith, these two hadith together. He narrated them separately, which is why Al-Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, separated the two. So, <clears throat> so he says... That Anas, uh, anhu, told him that Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, <coughs> he approached Uthman. He approached Uthman. So now who this? Hudayfa approaching Uthman. Now Uthman is the Khalifa at this time. Uthman is the Khalifa at this time. So he said, Anas anhu, says that Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, he approaches Uthman uh, in Hudayfa, uh, he fought along with the armies of Ahl al-Sham uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the fight in Irmi, Irminiya and Azerbaijan. Now, Irminiya and Azerbaijan, these are two places that are close to, or were close to Arum. They were close to Arum. They were close to uh, the Roman Empire up towards uh, the north. Um, and what happened was, 
the Muslim forces of Al Iraq and Al Sham joint they joined together. Now uh, uh, Al Iraq, we that's Maruf. Everyone knows, inshallah, Al Iraq. Uh, is there anyone who doesn't know where Al Iraq is? Okay, we know we all know Al Iraq, but Al Sham. Where is Al Sham? Well, modern day Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, but usually this is a sham. But a lot of times when you when people say a sham, they're referring to uh, Damascus. They're referring to Damascus. But uh, but the the uh, Bilad of Sham or the lands of Sham is modern day Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon. The this is what we consider to be a sham. So the, 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 the army of Al-Iraq and the army of Asham, they came together to fight in uh, Irminiya and Azerbaijan. All right? So now when this happened, obviously, they're making Salah. They're making Salah <coughs> together. Now the people of Sham recited the Quran with the recitation of Ubay ibn Ka'b. And the people of Al Iraq, they recited the Quran with the recitation of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. And because many of the soldiers, because they, many of them were not from the Sahaba, many of them were not from uh, the Sahaba at this time, and some of them <clears throat> were not as, they weren't knowledgeable. And what ended up happening was they started, <coughs> because they, they started to blame one another, they started to blame one another. Because the only recitation that they had ever learned was the recitation of Ubay ibn Ka'b in Asham. In, the, in Al-Iraq, the only recitation that they had learned is the recitation of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And so they started to blame one another to the point in some of the narrations that mentions that some of them started making takfir of each other. They started making takfir of one another. And, uh, <clears throat> and so this became a problem. This became... A problem. So Hudayfa, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, he says <coughs> um, that he went to Uthman and he said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, O leader of the believers, Adrik hadhi ummah. He said, you know, Do something about the ummah. Do something about the ummah before they start to differ in this book. The difference, uh, the way that the Jews and the Christians differed in their book. So do something before we start to differ about our book, the way that the Jews and the Christians differed about uh, their book. So Uthman, he sent to Hafsa that she should <coughs> send to him, <coughs> excuse me, she should send to him the copy of the Mus'haf uh, that... Um, that she had with her and that and he promised to give it back to her and so she sent uh, she sent it to Uthman she sent it to Uthman and then he ordered Zayd ibn Thabit and who remembers the other three Zayd ibn Thabit oh. I'll remind you inshallah so he ordered Zayd ibn Thabit Abdullah ibn Zubayr Sa'id ibn al-As and Abdul Rahman ibn al-Hadith ibn Hisham. And so they copied it into Musahif and Uthman said to the three of the Qurayshiyin. So there were four individuals. Three of them were from Quraysh. So the four were Zaid, Sa'id, Abdullah, and Abdul Rahman. Which of the three were from Quraysh? Or which one how about this is a little bit easier. Which of the four was not from Quraysh? Zayd. He was where? He was from where? Anybody know? He was Ansari. He was Ansari. Yeah, he was Ansari. And so, um, uh, Sa'id ibn al-As was Umawi. <coughs> Abdullah ibn Zubair was Asadi from Bani Asad. Uh, Sayyid ibn al-As was from Bani Umayyah and, and um, Abdul Rahman ibn al-Harith ibn Hisham was from Bani Makhzum. All three of these 
are sub-tribes of the larger tribe Quraysh. So Beni Umayyah, Beni Asad, and Beni Makhzum, they're all sub-tribes of the tribe of Quraysh. Right? And Zayd ibn Thabit was, who was in charge, was in charge of uh, the effort. He was from the Ansar. He was from the Ansar. So Uthman, ta'ala, he said to the three people from Quraysh, إِذَا اخْتَلَفْتُمْ أَنْتُمْ وَزَيْدِ بْنُ ثَابِتْ فِي شَيْءٍ مِنْ الْقُرْآنِ فَاكْتُبُوهُ بِلِسَانِ الْقُرَيْشِ فَإِنَّمَا نَزَلَ بِلِسَانِهِمْ He said, if you all differ with Zayd in the, uh, something from the Qur'an, then write it down in the language of Quraysh because <coughs> it was revealed in their language. And we talked about that last week, what that meant, the language of Quraysh uh, and the language of the Arabs. So they did so until they wrote down the, uh, the Qur'an into the, Musa, into the Musahif and Uthman returned the pages uh, that he bought, he turned them to, he returned them to Hafsa uh, and then he sent to every section uh, a Mus'haf, every portion of the Muslim lands, he sent a Mus'haf and he commanded that the rest of the Musahif uh, to be burned. He recommended everything else to be burned. And some of the ulama said that he wrote four musahif and he sent them out. Some of them said five, some of them said seven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. And so this is the second stage of the compilation of the Quran. So remember we said the first stage was just compiling it into one book. It was one mushaf. And so if that one mushaf was with Abu Bakr. And, that, and the purpose of that one Mus'haf was for the preservation of the Qur'an itself. The preservation of the Qur'an itself. And then the second stage was due to, or the compilation was due to uh, <coughs> the people and their differencing. The people and their differencing and Uthman collecting the people in uh, onto one recitation. And this shows us that the leader the leader, at times, he is allowed to prevent things that are permissible in order to unite the community. So I'll give you an example. Uh, and I've heard someone, uh, I've heard people speak out about this. Some of the masajid have clear uh, prohibitions against coming into the masjid with your shoes on. So a lot of the masajid have clear prohibitions against coming to the masjid with your shoes on. Right? So people say, how can, how can the leader prohibit something that the Prophet wasallam used to do? We say, okay, question. Is it permissible to pray without your shoes on? Yes. Is it permissible to pray with your shoes on? Yes. Okay. What if praying with your shoes on creates mass disturbance. What happens if you come into the masjid with your shoes on and it creates chaos? Then what do we do? We leave the shoes. And I can tell you, and I think I've told you this story before, first-hand experience. Where so, and I remember I, I had someone, we were, we were in, I was in Georgia, <coughs> I lived in Georgia at the time, and the, it was Salat al-Maghrib. I remember I was in the military. And, I, and, and, and so I was sitting on the side of the masjid in the area where you can have your shoes on. And I waited for them to call the iqama. And you know, I just learned this new sunnah. Um, and I was about 18 years old, 19 years old. And I was you know, fiery on the sunnah. So I waited. And then when he called the iqama, I walked into the musalla. And I lined up next to a brother. I put my foot next to his foot. And I had my boots on. And so nobody said anything until another brother came who stood on the other side of me and said, he said, listen, you need to take them shoes off. You need to take your boots off. So I ain't taking my boots off. This is the sunnah, akhi. What you talking about? Take my boots off. You don't know, let me teach you. I'll teach you the sunnah after we get done praying. No, you're going to take the boots off now. I said, no, I'm not. And he started yelling, raising his voice. Now, mind you, the iqama was called and we're lining up for the salah. And the brother storms out of the masjid and he left. 
and I've never seen them since. And a couple of years later, when I learned a little bit more about, you know, about Islam, it, I started to feel extremely heartbroken over this scenario because I was completely out of line. I was completely out of line while believing that I was calling to the sunnah. And in reality, I was calling away from the sunnah. And it's something that young people who have a little bit, who gain a little bit of knowledge without understanding, uh, they, can, uh, they can corrupt more than they rectify. Which is why it's important not just to uh, have uh, a knowledge, but also wisdom and understanding of the people of the past. <clears throat> and so I wish, uh, I wish, and if this brother ever is listening to the videos and ever comes across these videos, I wish that he would contact me so that I can apologize to him uh, for my actions. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me uh, for, for that. Um, but the point here is, why would a leader come and prevent these shoes? Because it can cause chaos and disruption. And the preservation of the ummah and the unity of the Muslims, that supersedes issues that, while may be permissible, but if it leads to haram, then we're going to have to put a stop to it. We're going to have to put a stop to it. And so Uthman did not tell people, you're not allowed to, it's haram to do X, Y, Z, but he, Ibn Salaam, rahmatullah, he united people on one mushaf. He united the people on one mushaf for the preservation of the ummah, for the preservation of uh, the ummah. <coughs> the last narration, inshallah, we'll read this, it's a short, inshallah, and they will call the adhan, um, where Ibn Shihab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that he was informed by Kharija, uh, Ibn Zayd, Ibn Thabit, and who's the son of Zayd, Kharija, Ibn Zayd, who said that he heard Zayd, his father, uh, say that I, uh, I, did, I couldn't find an ayah from an ahzab when I, was re when I was writing down the mushaf. And I used to hear the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, reciting it. And it shows us, remember what I made in the earlier point, that they did not only rely on the memory of Zayd, but there was a process that had, they had to go through. He said, I couldn't find a verse that... I used to hear the Prophet وسلم, reciting from Surah Al Ahzab, and I found it uh, with uh, Khuzayma ibn Thabit al Ansari. Uh, <coughs> and it was the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Min al Mu'minina Rijalun Sadaqu ma ahadu ma ahadu Allah alayhi. So we placed it uh, in the Surah that it uh, properly belonged to. And so here, again, this just shows us. And, and Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, brings this to show us that the Sahaba did not simply rely on memory and they did not simply rely on the writings, but rather they combined the two and the Mus'haf that they established was built on or was based on uh, the memory of the Sahaba who heard the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reciting and it was also based on those who uh, wrote down uh, what the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam used to recite. And they utilized both uh, as, as the methods of establishing uh, the Mus'haf. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala uh, accept it from them and reward them for their efforts. Inshallah, call the Adhan and then if there are any questions, Inshallah, we'll take them in the Lahi Ta'ala. Allah, who أشهد أن محمد رسول الله 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 هيا على الصلاة 
لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. هيا على الفلاح. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. هيا على الفلاح. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. الله أكبر الله أكبر. الله أكبر الله لا إله إلا الله اللهم رب هذه الدعوة التامة وصلاة القائمة أتي محمدا الوسيل والفضيل وبعث مقام محمود الذي وعدته نعم نعم Inshallah ta'ala, if you're around, if you're able to come to the class, we're going to deal with that issue, inshallah ta'ala, the chapter dedicated to that in specific. Uh, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the Quran was revealed on seven ahruf. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> and we talked about in our last class the language of the Arabs, because the Arabs did not all speak the same language. And so, uh, in the Qur'an, was, it was revealed and it addressed the Arabs. And uh, because different tribes, uh, like uh, Ghatafan, like Qahtan, uh, obviously Quraysh, uh, these tribes had different ways of speaking. These tribes had different ways of speaking. And these uh, Qira'at reflect the different languages uh, of the Arabs. So, for example... Uh, the Qira'ah of, 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 of Nafi'ah, uh, he doesn't have um, the, 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 the Hamza that's, that has the Sukun. So for example, in the statement of Allah, رَبَّنَا كْشِفْ عَنَّا الْعَذَابَ إِنَّا مُؤْمِنُونَ إِنَّا مُؤْمِنُونَ مُؤْمِنُونَ That's the Qira'ah of Nafi'ah. But in the Qira'ah that we, under, that we recite, the Qira'ah of, uh, of Asim, رَبَّنَا كْشِفْ عَنَّا الْعَذَابَ إِنَّا Mu'minun, right? But this is the language. This is how uh, this is how the Arab these Arabs spoke. This is how they spoke, um, <clears throat> and so you had you know, and there's there's many differences. This is not. I'm just bringing a quick example, but there are many differences between the language of the different tribes, and it was all considered to be fusha. It was all considered to be fusha, like, and I think I brought the example of the lugha akaluni al baraghith لغة أكلوني البراغيف or they call it لغة يتعاقبون فيكم ملائكة or يتعاقبون فيكم الملائكة and so in the Quran you have this language represented in the Quran even though if, if I was to speak to you this way uh, the Arabs would say oh you've made a mistake this is linguistically is not proper but there was a, there were, there, some, some of the Arabs spoke like this some of the Arabs, they spoke like this, and this language was represented in the Qur'an. And so you have the Qira'at, and so, <clears throat> so, some of the usul, so you have the Usul, and you have Farsh. And, these, and, and so the Usul of the Qira'at is based on, a lot of that is based on the language, which language that this Qira'at represents, right? And so when you have the, the language itself, is, is in the Qira'ah, that Qira'ah may even, you listen to it, it may even sound, for you, you may sound a little bit, uh, you may say, oh, that, that not right. Right, it sounds not right. Uh, no, no, that's not correct. You say, yeah, that's, that's, that's from the, that's a lugha from the language of the Arabs, that the sod is pronounced close to uh, a zay. The, the sod is pronounced close to a zay, and that's represented in the uh, Qira'at. And so, yes, uh, the Qur'an was revealed on seven ahruf and is represented in these uh, recitations. Inshallah ta'ala, uh, I don't want to uh, confuse anybody because and, 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 and make it seem like it's simple because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conversation or that, de that deserves uh, a, a lectures in of themselves. And there's actual schools that teach this. Like, the schools that teach it uh, by itself. And so this is an actual tachassus, an actual specialty where people specialize in the language of the Qur'an or the language of the, 
of the of the qiraat. Uh, and so uh, with that, hopefully, inshallah, ta'ala answered your question. But you come, inshallah, there's a chapter uh, that Bukhari brings about the ahruf. Bukhari brings a whole chapter on that issue. We're going to talk about it, inshallah, ta'ala. هذا والله تعالى أعلم صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد